Welcome to Slash Forward. In this episode, we're going to explore the wonders of puberty as Martin Brundle comes of age in front of our very eyes with the Fly 2. Let's get to it. We open at Bartok Industries, makers of industrial products and technological marvels, and deliverers of babies. Apparently, Veronica's stand-in never made it back to the clinic, and is now giving birth to a crime against nature before expiring. The doctors crack open the birth pod to find a bouncing baby boy. Congrats? At a subsequent board meeting, we find Mr. Bartok himself giving instructions for his expectations around caring for the child, who is now property of the company. Luckily for the plot, his life cycle is dramatically accelerated. Because babies are boring. Mr. Bartok meets him for the first time at 11 months old and asks, asks Martin to call him Daddy, setting a fairly low bar for the future. Martin develops into a precocious young man, showing up the intelligentsia who provide his care and generally pissing everyone off. Desiring more room to play, he hooks himself up with Zone 4 access and goes sleuthing in an inconspicuous manner. Luckily he does because he finds a good boy to be his friend, although at his next return his pal's been transferred for experimentation, the results of which reshape the way Martin views his benefactors. We then fast forward to his fifth birthday where we see he's becoming a big boy and wishes for the gift of privacy, which Mr. Bartok grants with a bitchin' new bachelor pad and the offer of an official job to keep him engaged while stuck on premise for his necessary medical treatment. His job is to continue in his father's footsteps because they haven't even gotten off the ground. After showing him some tapes, he's inspired to give it a go, setting his superfly intelligence to the task and quickly mastering the basics. Mm, but does he understand the poetry of the flesh? While exploring, he meets Beth, who he befriends to help him pass the time, and we montage through their relationship with an interesting choice of music. <laughs> She invites him to a party where he overhears talk of a genetic experiment that's managed to defy expectations by surviving for two years. Curious about this, he goes to find a dank pit occupied by his loyal dog, now living in misery, contrary to Bartok's prior claim of a quick death. He continues his work, demonstrating his progress to Beth with a test kitty, who comes out just fine. He explains about the power of love or something, which gets her all worked up, resulting in Beth Logan betting a five-year-old. The next morning, in the warm dawn light, Beth romantically examines his infected wound. Martin appears to be interested in removing his mutation, a problem solved by just asking a computer questions, I guess. We learn that he has a chain reaction of aberrant chromosomes popping off inside his body that's unavoidable now that he's reached maturity. It's now important to sequester him, so they transfer Beth across town and let her know they have video of her sexcapades. They try to prevent all communication, but Martin patches through manually, and news of the invasion of his privacy sets him off. He throws a massive hissy fit before busting into the peepin' room. He sets to educating himself by pulling up clips at an impossibly fast pace for a tape-based system. Bartok also shows up to let him know they've anticipated the coming metamorphosis, and his his medicine has been a placebo. Since their business model is based on genetic mistakes, they intend to let him transform so they can study him. Despite the potential impact to his stock options, Martin runs off. Scorby tries to stop him by laying down the gauntlet, but learns just how powerful flies can be. Back at the lab, the workaday scientists are playing catch up, but find the system password protected, getting an ah ah ah, followed by a proving the heavy influence this film had on Steven Spielberg. Meanwhile, Martin shows up at Beth's houseboat to reveal his deformities and confide that there's no getting off this roller coaster now that it's started. They then embark on a journey of self-discovery, driving out to meet up with Stathis, no longer living in the city, and he fills them in on how the movie ends. He offers the keys to his Jeep, but they take the Bronco instead. Along the way, Martin reveals that the pods can heal him with donor DNA, but the donor would have to be a sacrifice. They get a hotel room and Martin gets the standard metamorphosis second wind. Feeling ready to take on the world, plucking out body parts, Parts and freaking out Beth. She tries to help him the only way she knows how, by betraying his trust and calling in his kidnappers, who promptly re-kidnap him. They monitor his chrysalis, estimating a week to maturation, giving them plenty of time to pump Beth for the magic word. But Martin does a bit of a surprise party emergence, killing Dr. Janeway while he's in a cheeky mood. His premature birthday is discovered, and they're on high alert, but remarkably incapable of finding the giant fly creature lumbering around. He makes several attempts to get into the pod room, throwing scientists and straight squirting on fools until crashing through the glass. The security guards are taken out, one very slowly by an elevator, and then Scorby by being broken in half. Bartok puts up a fight, but Martin grabs him and uses his pudgy fingers to pound out the magic word before dragging him into the pod. Despite Bartok being fully clothed, his sacrifice works. Bartok emerges like so many of his prior experiments, with Martin hatching safely from his anal sack, looking like a million bucks after his stem cell bath. Bartok is then observed for educational purposes. And that was The Fly 2, The Magic of Adolescence. If you enjoyed the video, I'd love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.